I have come to a decision. After much thought, I think that it's totally unjust that some people make less than $100 per hour. I could afford to live, not just survive, on $100 per hour, so I demand that the federal minimum wage be raised to $100 per hour. I think that it's time for some roasted opinions, don't you? Now, the federal minimum is currently $7.25 per hour. That means that in 2009, when the minimum wage was increased to its current level, minimum wage workers in 31 states got raises. In six states, there was no change because their state minimum wage was already $7.25 per hour. And in 13 states, the federal minimum wage increase changed absolutely nothing because their state minimum wage was already more than $7.25 per hour. Washington, D.C. was an interesting case. Their minimum wage was already $7.55, but it increased to $8.25 because D.C. law mandates that their minimum wage be a dollar per hour higher than federal minimum wage. Everyone can see why minimum wage is important to low-wage employees, but it's also important to employers because payroll is the single biggest cost of doing business. A few years ago, some food service workers started demanding that they receive $15 per hour minimum wage. Why? Because they couldn't pay their bills on the current minimum wage. Makes sense, right? If you can't pay your bills with $7.25 per hour, but you can if you're paid $15 per hour, then why not make $15 per hour the minimum wage? Certain cities like Seattle responded by raising the minimum wage to or even beyond the $15 per hour demanded. Seattle will serve as my example as they have passed a city ordinance requiring large employers to pay a $16 per hour minimum wage. That's right, those franchise food service workers in Seattle will earn $16 per hour this year. Or be replaced by ordering kiosks, which even though they are installed and serviced by people who earn far more than minimum wage, actually cost less than hiring minimum wage employees at $16 per hour. This should also make sense. Businesses don't operate to provide jobs. They operate to earn a profit, because for the business owner, the business is their job. Interestingly, minimum wage laws don't apply to the compensation that an owner receives. Their income is derived from the profits of the business, and for them to pay their personal bills, they need to make sure that the cost of operating their business stays far enough below the sales of that business that the business makes a profit. Not just any profit, though. The owner needs to make sure that they leave some of the profits invested in the business for use to maintain and improve that business. If they can't do that, then they cut payroll by firing people or the businesses close. The calls for an increase in minimum wage grew, though, because in some places like Seattle, employees earn much more than in other places, and that's not fair, is it? Naturally, certain politicians seized on this as an easy way to pick up votes from low-wage workers especially in those areas that don't enjoy the higher minimum wage. Politicians like Bernie Sanders, who strongly advocates for a $15 federal minimum wage. Except when it comes to his campaign workers, apparently. They were being paid less than $15 per hour, and when that news went public because his unionized employees demanded $15 per hour and health care, Bernie naturally raised his hourly wage to $15 per hour except that Bernie didn't have any more money available in his payroll, so he did it by cutting their hours. Effectively, he's paying them the same amount for less work. They lost hours to accomplish their job, and he lost work being done by them when they were paid less than $15 per hour. Well, so what? They can just volunteer their hours after they're done working, right? Except that that's a violation of federal employment law. You cannot make a worker work voluntarily if they are a paid employee. Now, the same thing happened with federal work-study students. When their minimum wages go up, they are paid more per hour. But because the money to pay work-study students is given as a grant from the Federal Department of Education to the college, the total amount of hours available for the students to work went down. Same pay, less work. 
Now, the students didn't mind it as much because they had more time to study or even look for a second job. But isn't that sad when college students have to work two jobs while they attend school full-time just to make ends meet? Now, has there been an effort to raise the amount available for work-study? No, not really, because there's a finite amount of money available for federal student aid, and increases are being channeled primarily into funding student loans. That's actually part of the reason why low-wage employees want more money, because many are saddled with huge amounts of student debt, and the economy is only recently rebounding back to something approximating health. Most past college students want to repay their student debt because they really can't borrow much more money for a decent car or a home if they owe over $37,000 on average, especially if their loans are in default. Now I get it. I went to college too, and I owe quite a bit of money on my student loans. At the rate I'm repaying them, I may be able to borrow money again sometime around 2044 when I hope to retire. Then again, since I want to leave at least some equity to my kids after I'm gone, I may never retire. I may just start drawing my Social Security checks and keep working because past full retirement age, there is no penalty to your Social Security pension check if you keep working. You just have to watch how much you work and how much you earn in order to make sure that you don't wind up having to pay taxes on your Social Security. Now that is, of course, if I can keep working. The CBO released its findings on the effect of a $15 minimum wage. While it estimates that 27 million workers would get a raise, 17 million of them would be minimum wage workers, a significant increase in the number of minimum wage workers in our country. 10 million more would get a small raise above the new minimum wage. Perhaps 1.3 million would find themselves lifted out of poverty, but another estimated 1.3 million would find themselves unemployed. And that number of potentially unemployed people could go as high as 3.7 million, according to the CBO's report. That would at least reduce the employment figures to November 2018 levels, and possibly as high as January 2018 levels. Now this will have a significant negative impact on the economy. Because our economy affects the economy of the rest of the world, it would also further slow down the global economy, which in many countries, <coughs> Europe, is on the verge of recession. So why not just roll the dice if tens of millions will still get a raise? Because there will be more minimum wage employees, and the wages of those above minimum wage will be devalued. We use a fiat currency in America. Minimum wage remains minimum wage, whether $7 or 15 and as payroll costs rise, the cost of living will rise to absorb the temporary benefit of those larger paychecks. Again, business owners, especially small business owners, are depending on making a profit. That's their job. The cost of living increases from the runaway inflation created by such a massive rise will have people agitating for further minimum wage increases. Because no matter if the minimum wage is $5.15, $7.25, $15, or even $100 per hour, no one can live on minimum wage. The point behind the minimum wage isn't to guarantee that people can draw a living wage anyway. Minimum wage jobs traditionally have been filled by those who are not dependent on them as their sole source of income. It's to provide an incentive to those who are on minimum wage to gain the skills and experience necessary, even the education necessary, to get a job that earns more money. Perhaps we should keep that in mind when we go to the polling precincts in November 2020 and tell all of these politicians pandering to our collective desire to escape poverty that we see through their pie-in-the-sky promises. We should tell them, um, no, just no, because it'll never be enough, will it? See what I mean? Even after the CBO told us that a $15 minimum wage would cost over a million jobs, Representative Tlaib added $5 more to the amount that she demanded as the federal minimum wage. For the love of Mike, how many jobs will that cost America?